Okay, this is a uh, introductory programming class. This is technical stuff, and hopefully it will inspire some people who may not have ever tried to write a device driver to maybe actually try it if they have something they want supported or for whatever, just for fun. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the way a device driver is laid out. Essentially, you have two segments of memory. You have a data segment and a code segment. And a requirement of a device driver is that there's a header at the beginning of your data segment. And this header contains information uh, that informs the kernel how to access your driver. There's pointers into a strategy routine. And that is how the driver talks to, how the kernel talks to your driver. A 32-bit driver will actually have another segment, a 32-bit code segment, in addition to the two segments that a 16-bit driver has. The data segment also has the header, the same. That header has to be there because the kernel expects it to be there. And this is not the only way to build a 32-bit driver. This is just how I have done it because this makes things very easy. Okay, any questions? Feel free to ask questions. I'm going to kind of move along because I'm going to get to an actual writing a device driver in real life, real time. Okay, moving on. The main thing that your driver needs to have for communication with the kernel is the strategy handler. The first time, so when your driver gets loaded via a device statement or a base dev statement in your, um, in your config.sys, the first thing the, drive, the kernel will do is load your driver into memory, set up the device header. It'll read the, the address out of the device header so it knows what function to call to initialize your driver. And it also will write the code segment and data segment selectors into that header. So the first thing the kernel does is it calls that strategy handler with an init function. And that allows your driver to do whatever it needs to do to initialize itself. Then later on, after all of the drivers are loaded, the, driver, the kernel will call your driver again with a function called init complete. At this point, you're guaranteed that all the other drivers are loaded. And this is the time you would do things like connect to other drivers for inter-driver communication, for example. If one driver needs to talk to another driver, this is when they would connect to each other. The USB drivers do that a lot. They do a lot of talking between the different drivers via this inter-driver communication mechanism. There are other functions that the uh, strategy handler can implement, such as open, close, read, write, save, restore, shut down, various things. The open, close, and read, and write are exactly mapped to when you would do a open a file open in a program, and a file read, and a file write. And that's the kind of example I'm going to show you today. To make writing device drivers easy, I've developed these two kits. And I mentioned these kits in the Multimac presentation, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about them now. Um, these two kits essentially provide everything you need to to build a device driver except for the unique pieces that would be applicable to whatever device you're trying to operate or whatever function you're trying to accomplish. So in these kits, you get essentially a skeleton of a complete working driver that does nothing, that will load and do nothing. Then all that's required is to add the unique pieces that you need to do whatever it is you need to do. If you're trying to write a driver to, I don't know, let's say talk to a piece of hardware, and you have a simple piece of hardware, like a serial port, for example, all you need to do is add the pieces that talk to that piece of hardware to the driver, and everything else is provided. So a 16-bit driver I mentioned last time there's really no limitations to 16-bit drivers, because that's the driver model that OS2 supports already. 
So anything that you can do in a 16-bit driver, any, written any other way, you can also do with the 16-bit driver kit. The, the thing that has been difficult all along with OS2 is writing 32-bit drivers. Now this 32-bit driver kit is significantly more complex than the 16-bit driver kit because it provides all of the thunking modules, all of the thunking functions. It, it essentially makes all of the weird and crazy stuff that's required to implement a 32-bit driver completely transparent to the developer. You don't need to worry about anything other than writing your own code in a 32-bit C module. Okay, so it makes it really easy. The um, the diff it provides a lot of things. It provides a C all this all the C library type functions that you are normally used to using in C applications. It provides, like I said, all the thunking modules. It provides a heat manager. All of this stuff stuff in 32 bits, so that the developer really doesn't need to be concerned about the peculiarities of a 32-bit driver. The only thing that is a little bit different are the limitations, and the primary limitations come in in the initialization of your driver. Uh, IBM did a, a special thing for 16-bit drivers that allows 16-bit drivers to call a lot of the normal DOS functions at initialization time, like DOS open, DOS close, DOS read, various other things so that you can do file I.O. or whatever you need to do to initialize your driver. Now you cannot do those things in a 32-bit driver because those functions are not available. And the main reason is because of a unique thing that IBM did when they, when they implemented the driver interface is that the initialization functions of a 16-bit driver run at ring 3, not ring 0. My, did I lose anybody there? Okay, good. Now, because of the way a 32-bit driver has to run, maybe, the initial... Maybe you could still explain what rings... Does any, how many people know what ring 0 and ring 3 is? Probably a few or some of the developers. Anybody not know? <laughs> how about thunking? That's, that's another... Thunking. Okay. Essentially, ring 0 is the highest privilege level thing there is. A kernel runs at ring zero. All dri device drivers run at ring zero. At ring zero, you can do anything you want. There's no restrictions. There's no privilege restrictions. Ring three is the most restricted privilege level. It's what all applications run at. Applications run at ring three. And the reason there's these different privilege levels is because it's to prevent applications from doing kernel type things. Like you cannot, you could, at ring three, you can only access the memory that's given to your application. You can't access memory outside of your application. That's just one example. Another example is you typically cannot talk to the hardware at ring three. <coughs> Any I.O. operations are blocked by the, by the CPU because the CPU, certain instructions have different privilege levels associated with them. And ring three can do anything, but ring three, like if you try and do an I.O. operation, in most cases, the, you'll get a trap because the CPU knows that ring three things can't do I.O. operations. They're not supposed to be able to talk to the hardware. Now, I.O. operations are kind of different because you can assign I.O. privilege levels to certain applications, and then they can, but that's a kind of a limited case. So anyway, that's the difference between the different rings. Ring zero is the kernel highest privilege level. Device drivers typically operate at ring zero. You can do anything you want at ring zero. At ring three, you can do almost nothing except talk to your own <coughs> stuff. So anyway, the reason that this becomes an issue is IBM implemented device driver init time at ring three. So specifically so that it can access some of the application DOS calls. Now, when we implemented ring, I mean, 32-bit 32-bit device drivers, it, we had to go to ring zero in order to convert to 32-bit mode, which means that the initialization time runs at ring zero, which means you cannot access any of the ring three code that was previously available to other drivers. So you're very limited there in what you can do. <coughs> 
sometimes that's a problem, sometimes it's not. Um, so it all depends what you need to do. And that's really the, the basis of the restrictions. Let's move on a little bit. Maybe I missed it in your answer, but somebody else asked the question, what is thunking? Oh, thunking. Thunking is the conversion between 32-bit and 16-bit, or 16-bit to 32-bit. Um, the kernel, act, I mean, the CPU actually operates in 16-bit mode or 32-bit mode, where the instructions are actually interpreted as 16-bit instructions or 32-bit instructions. And the data pointers are actually interpreted as 16-bit pointers or 32-bit pointers. And the stack can be a 16-bit stack or a 32-bit stack. So when, you, when your driver gets called by the kernel, it's always called at a 16-bit interface. So it's called with a 16-bit code selector and a 16-bit data selector. So you need to thunk that to a 32-bit code selector and a 32-bit data selector and a, can convert from a 16-bit stack to a 32-bit stack. The driver kits do that for you, and you don't even have to think about that, where ordinarily you would have to think about that. And then when you return back to the kernel, it has to all be thunked back. So that's what thunking is. So. There, there is a ring two. I'm not aware that there is a ring one. Ring one, one is not used. It's not used. Ring one is not used. It's only ring two. Ring two is used for some things, like the video driver runs at ring two. I don't think it even runs at ring two. Yes. In the config sys, there's that statement, IO, IO DL equals yes or no. That's different. That's, That's different. different. The device driver does run at ring two. Ring one is not used. And the only thing I'm aware of that runs at ring two is the video stuff. Applications run at ring three, device drivers run at ring zero, kernel runs at ring zero. Okay? I'm sorry, what, when you build it? You have a device or a base device. Yes. Base and, and what's the difference? What's the difference? The difference, the difference, the difference primarily is when they're loaded. Base drivers are loaded very, very early in the boot process and provide basic system functionality. Device drivers are loaded in a second wave after all the base devs are loaded. That's the primary difference. There are, other, there are other differences, but that's the primary difference. There's much less system resources available to base devs because they're loaded so early. That's, that's part of it, yes. That's part of it. Very little of the system is running when base devs load. Very, very little. There's no file system available at when base devs load, for example. But Take there is when drivers, when d devices are loaded. Take a look in your config sys, you'll see that most base devs, as David said, provide the rudimentary stuff. They like do. They provide the very, control, very basic the storage stuff. Storage controller, uh, the screen on one gets loaded. It's basically just about sufficient that the system can stand alone output text mode to the screen. And after the base devs are loaded, then your file system driver like HPFS or JFS gets loaded. And then it starts going through the stuff like the okay. The main thing, the main difference is when they're loaded. Base devs are loaded very, very early. So if you need something done, if you need to do something very, very early in the boot process, you would write a base dev. If you run just the normal, most normal I.O. devices are normal device drivers. Anyway, the driver kits make all of this stuff that we've been talking about very, very easy. And we haven't had this until very recently. <coughs> Like I said, it implements all the memory layout stuff, the system interface, all the compiler setup stuff is in these kits. So really, you don't need to go looking and digging for a lot of information. Yes? Open Whatcom. It also provides memory management functions. It provides all the thunking functions in case you need to do some thunking on your own. Um, it provides a heat manager. Um, memory allocation, deallocation, memory mm -hmm. those type of things. Um, it essentially, exactly, it provides everything you need except for the stuff that's unique to your own application, your own device, whether it's a device, 
if it's a filter driver. Not all, not all drivers talk to hardware. Some drivers just do software things that, things that need to be done at ring zero that you can't do in an application, like application helpers. Those are very common. So all you need to do is worry about the code for your own hardware. Okay, any questions? There's somebody here asking on IRC, can you repeat the questions, please? But I'll oh, just ask yeah. What it means, but yes. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So what's actually in one of these kits? I know it's kind of small. Hopefully everybody can read this. There's a kit directory, which essentially contains a library called like Drive 16 Live. There's a header file, which contains the headers for all the functions that are in the library. Um, and there's a couple, there's a few more header files. One of the things that is implemented in the driver kits is the NDIS, NDIS modules, because mainly I wrote these to, to work on um, Ethernet drivers, network drivers, so there's an NDIS module. And there's a PCI module for talking to the PCI bus for you. So all of that's handled as well. Sometimes that's a, a bit of work to do. Then there's two other drivers, two other directories. There's a uh, required directory, which essentially is the bare minimum required to build a driver and have it load. It's got a driver.c file and a base dev.c file and a make file that builds these. So these are essentially drivers that will build and will load and do nothing. So if you wanted to start building a driver, you would start with one of those and just start adding in the stuff you need. In addition to that, there's a sample directory which contains a real live working driver. It's a very simple driver that talks to an I.O. <laughs> card. It's a plug-in card that has some I.O. ports that you would use for something like home automation or talking to whatever. It's just, it's just essentially I.O. ports. And it's a real live working driver. It also contains test.c, which is an application that talks to the driver through the IOCTL interface. So you can see a real working driver with real working DOSDEV IOCTL calls and how those are implemented. And you could take that one and modify it to whatever your own needs are. So I thought what I would do next is actually do this. I would take the, the driver.c file and modify it to, a, to perform a, a very simple function, compile it, load it, and run it in real time, to just to see how easy that is. I actually already talked about this. Those are the two, two examples of the two drivers that are provided in the kit. And next comes a live demonstration. So here we go. Let's see if this actually, I can actually pull this off. Let's see if this will. There we go. So I have a directory here on my, on my system that currently has the driver kit as you would download it from my website. It's the zip file. Can everybody see that? Yeah? That's as big as it gets. I could do a full screen session. Okay, let's see if I can do a full screen session. <coughs> yeah. I think Alt Home doesn't work on those two screen session DOS. Yeah, let me see if I can get it. Uh, where can I? Uh, where do I find these? <laughs> Command, I want a full screen prompt. To the right there, that thing. No, it doesn't. Oh, yeah. See, your brain goes to mush when you're in front of people. <laughs> uh, full screen, let's see. Okay, well, the problem is some projectors. Now, yeah, the projector has to. Has to some projectors can't handle. Does it handle the resolution? I've had beamers that don't... Uh, there, there we go. Yay. Cool. 
Is that easier to see? Yeah. So we have a Drive 16 kit. Really, once you, after you download it, all you have to do is unzip it. And it will create, there's the directories that I just talked about. It creates a kit directory with the headers in it, requires required directory, and it creates sample directory. So let's move into the required directory. And there's the three files that we talked about. Now this should just build if I type make, what w make. Okay, except it's not going to because because I haven't defined, I haven't told it where my kit is yet. And what the way you do that, there's um, help, there's a readme that will describe all of this. But what you, all you really have to do actually, is set an environment variable. And then the driver builds. So now I have a driver. I have two drivers. I have the base dev driver that's built. You can see base dev.sys, and I have driver.sys. Now I could actually put those into my config.sys and reboot, and they would load and do nothing. So essentially, just by downloading this kit, you can build drivers. Anybody can. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's true. It doesn't do anything, but you actually built a driver that will load. You do need the DDK. Yep, you do need the DDK. And that is one thing that I already have installed. And I have the DDK already installed, and I have an environment variable pointing to my DDK. Okay? And you need Open Watcom installed. I also have Watcom installed. So <laughs> Watcom, Watcom, and the, all you need is the Watcom equals wherever your Watcom installation is, and you can. That's freely available. You can go to the Watcom and download it and install it. Temporarily, I'm sure. Okay, so let's do something. Let's. Um, Let's create our own driver. Let's start with This is one reason I didn't want to go to full screen because, okay, this is the this is the driver.c file that is shipped with the kit. It has lots of comments in it that tell you how it works and what you need to do. Like for example, it says you must have the strategy handler, and there is one in here, and it it does basically nothing. There's remember I told you that the first thing the kernel does when it calls your driver it calls his strategy init. Well, here is your strategy init. And it says here it's called by the kernel immediately after loading your driver. And the kit gives you the strategy init call, which is later on in the file. And what the strategy init does is it sets the name of the driver here. I assume you can see this, yep. And it calls the kit init, which is this, this function here is the drive 16 init, which initializes the kit functions for you. You have to tell the kernel the size of your data segment and text segment, code segment, and it outputs something to the screen, and it's done. So basically, that's it. So what we're going to do is we're going to add some code to this, which will respond to a copy command, which a copy will open the file, read something from the driver, and copy it to a file. It's really going to be pretty easy. So what we're going to do is we're going to need to have 
an open function. So let's add something called strategy open. And we're going to pass it the request packet. When the driver calls this, when the kernel calls a driver, it passes a packet of information to the driver, which basically says what, I, what, what it wants to do. And that's called the request packet. And it's a pointer to this request packet. See when your strategy handler is called here, it passes a pointer to the request packet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a strategy open function. And I realize I might be losing some people, but But we're going to write a strategy open and a strategy close. And we're also going to need a strategy read. So what I've done there is I've just put a call to strategy open in the strategy open case of the case statement. I put a strategy close in the strategy close portion, and I put a strategy read function in the strategy read. Okay, so everybody understands that? Yeah, okay. So now I have to go write those functions. So let's go and put those functions right before my strategy handler. Yeah, let's put it right here. Okay, the first thing I need is some... Um, let's define a buffer to store some data in. Let's just make it like 1K. And we're going to need a flag like Something to tell me whether the whether the driver has been opened or not, and some some uh, sizes, so that I can keep track of how much. Get my fingers on the right keys here, so we can keep track track of how many bytes of da of data the application has read. And then let's start. So I don't know if that was a very good explanation. It's a pretty complex subject, and I tried to just do it in 30 seconds. But um, when the kernel calls a strategy read routine, it's past the physical memory address. So you need to convert that to something that, th that you can actually write to. And that would be a virtual address in a 16-bit driver. So I'm going to do that. So what I'm going to do is first convert, first calculate how much memory, how many bytes is left to read, which is how much memory, how many we've already read minus how many we need to still read. Get my fingers on the right keys here. If you uh, made a mistake uh, somewhere up, you use two times uh, read uh, count and instead on uh, read size for after sending your message. As as the oh, I did. This should be read size. This is the total size of the block of memory that can be read. And the read count is how much I've already read. So There we go. 
What that statement does is I don't want to ever return more bytes than was asked for. If there's still So far, so good? Uh, <laughs> hey, you're catching all my compiler errors. That what you meant? That, yeah, that is exactly right. That's it. So all I did here is calculate how much, how many bytes I'm going to return, copy it from my message buffer to the virtual address I just got. Oh, I did forget something, didn't I? I keep talking about converting this physical address to a virtual address, but I didn't do it. Those of you who have worked with the DDK know what that is. That's a dev help with one of the helper functions that's implemented in the kernel to convert a physical address to a virtual address. If that fails, of course, I want to return an error. There. Now we have a complete driver. Hopefully it will compile, and it should run. Any questions about what I've done so far? Everybody understand what that, what I just did there? I added my new driver to the list of things this make file will build. <gasps> the reason that happened is because I did this in the full screen session before.
fixing my compilation errors. Whoops. This is, ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't see what's wrong with that. Oh, yes, I do. For some reason, my dash key is really having trouble on this computer since I used it last. Now what's wrong? What? Oh. Oh, 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 oh. That's what you were trying to tell me before. There. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it. to the root of my boot disk, just because it's a convenient place to put it. I'm going to add a device statement. Can a device try for more than eight characters alone? Yes. Oh. Why not? I don't think so. We'll find out. One other thing that I want to show you in it before we is um, the name of this driver is right here. This is the driver name that's written into the header. It's called mydrv$. You could make that anything you wanted. The, um, you have eight characters maximum for the driver name, and it needs to be blank padded. But the, uh, the driver kit function handles all that for you. So anyway, it's there. Let's reboot. Is it a base? No, it's a regular driver. That might, but this is not a base step. See the line right there? Driver my drive loaded successfully. That was the string that you saw in the init function, strategy init when the driver is loaded. So apparently it loaded it. The kernel liked it. It loaded itself successfully. So let's try copy. Can you see that? So I go go to a full screen session. Does that string look familiar? That's the s printf that was in my driver. So what I've done is this copy command has opened my driver did a read to read the data from the driver and display it on the screen. That's something it's not too hard to do. Now, if you needed to talk to actual hardware, your, your code would look different than what I just wrote. But, you know, it's not not any more complicated. You'd have to have knowledge of the hardware that you're trying to operate. But anybody who can read a data sheet and write C code should be able to write device drivers. And like I said at the beginning, the purpose of this uh, presentation was to maybe 
show you that it's not all that daunting to write a device driver anymore. If you can write C code, and you can run a compiler, and you have the DDK, and you can download this kit, and you can get a data sheet for the, the hardware you want to run, time. Just time. Just Maybe it'll inspire some people. Like if you have a, an I.O. card or something that you want to operate that there's no drivers for, or somebody wants to write a Bluetooth driver, or something like that, you know? Give it a try. Are you also going to mention something about SMP issues or not? Why? What SMP issues? Well, I know that when you were, wrote, when you were writing the device drivers, you, you told me how many SMP issues there were always hiding in all kinds of corners. But yeah. A bit too advanced. The SMP issues exist for everything, not just drivers. Um, SMP issues come up when you have more than one CPU trying to run your code at the same time. And you need to make sure that any resources that may be shared that need to be protected from access simultaneously by both processors. Like if you have a chunk of memory that has well, like for example, a good example would be if you do have a piece of hardware and you have a hardware register that you need to write to, to, um, I don't know, operate your device. If one CPU is, is currently chunking out data to this port and another CPU comes in and wants to do it and wants to talk to the port at the same time, obviously you're going to have problems because what one CPU is trying to write to it may not be compatible with the other CPU is trying to write to it. So you use things like spin locks or, or um, mutexes or something to, to block access from one CPU. So one CPU has complete access of this resource for the entire time it needs it. So the other one will wait and won't, won't try and do it. This is, this is normal things for anybody who's worked with multi-CPU systems. The problem that we've had with old stuff is most SMP systems didn't exist when a lot of our code was written. So nobody thought about it in some cases or didn't implement it properly. But now, it, now we have lots of SMP systems. They're very common. Yeah? Is it possible to write a base tip yes. that will delay the loading of other base tips? Yes. Yes. Because they're processed in sequence. They are processed in sequence. So yeah, if you put it in, in between one driver and the other, yeah, it'll, yours will execute in sequence that they are in, this, in the config.sys. And however long it takes, it takes. There are, there are drivers that already do that. Yeah, there, yeah, I have a driver that does that. The thing that you need to, to be aware of is, like I was talking about earlier, base devs operate very, very early in the boot sequence. So there's not very many resources available to you. So any delay that you do, you can't like make system calls to do it. You have to do right there in your own code. Right. Yeah. Something like that, yes. There's a question here on the IRC channel, and somebody asks what code editor you use to edit the source Mr. code. Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed, okay. And Andy Willis is asking, why should I use the 32-bit driver instead of the 30-16-bit? The what are the advantages? And DBA net here answers that porting 32-bit drivers is easier. Yeah, typically, if you're going to start writing an original driver, then it's a fairly simple thing to do. The 16-bit kit is the, is the easier one to use. If you're going to port a driver, like from Linux or from somewhere else, that's 
written, written as a 32-bit driver. So your C module that you're going to port and try and recompile is, is already a 32-bit source code, then you're better off using the, writing a 32-bit driver because you'll have less problems in your C file. Your variable sizes in a 16-bit driver are 16 bits. The variable sizes in 32-bit driver are 32 bits, and that can be an issue sometimes, unless the coder has thought about that. So um, yeah, for porting stuff, the 32-bit is probably a better choice. Any other questions? I have no more on IRC here currently. That's why when I, in the multi-Mac, um, I went to the 32-bit stuff for, the, for all the stuff that I'm currently porting. It just makes the porting job easier. Plus, you have unlimited code size in 32-bit drivers. You don't have the unlimited data size. You can, uh, you can always allocate as much data as you want by allocating it from the kernel, but your data segment size is fixed at 64K. Okay, anything else? Well, hopefully this was somewhat informative. I kind of, it was very simple and meant to be introductory and meant to not take very much time. So I kind of skipped over a lot of detail, but hopefully you see that how to use the kit and how easy it is to actually get drivers built these days. Well, <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice, and I don't know why it wasn't done already. And there are tools like that, like the DDK has, has a lot of things that are common but it wasn't organized as nicely as this. And one of the things that the kit does for you is it gives you the, the familiar C environment with your normal C calls like mem copy, string length, sprintf, printf, those sorts of things that you're used to using all the time that are sorely lacking in the normal but past driver environments. Yeah. I go look at all my CDs from my developer connection kit. Is there, uh, there different versions of the DK? Or when was the last one just you know, about you know, like going to there and making those connections? I know there there were changes to the DDK. So I, I honestly I can't answer that question. If, uh, what you're going to find? Um, I mean I think I had it fairly late, like, beyond the point where I really should have had it. Uh, as far as getting any of those stuff. It's probably going to be fine. Okay. I know there's a couple files that got updated to be compatible with the Open Wacom stuff. Send me an email if you have trouble with that. Okay. Uh, th there's another question here, but I don't know, that's, I think that's beyond the scope of your presentation. The BANet is asking here, what about a PSD? A PSD is a very, very special device driver. It's, n it, well, it's, it's not really a driver in, this, in the sense of these drivers. It, um, it gets loaded via a different kernel interface. It's a totally different animal, totally different. And it's not within the scope of this presentation. Would you at least say about a PSD that it's a very deep extension of the kernel? It is. I was just going to say that. A PSD is a kernel extension. It's a kernel plugin. It's, it's not, it's, uh, I guess you could think of device drivers as kernel plugins too, but it's a, it's a different interface. It's a, it's a thing that the kernel knows, has intimate knowledge about the interface to the PSD. A PSD is just a, PSD stands for Platform Specific Driver. Anyway, if you do decide to try and write a driver, there are other examples besides these in the kit. 
the multi-MAC drivers use the Drive 16 and the Drive 32 kits. You, and those are open source. You can go look at those and see how they were done. As, like I said yesterday, NBETF and E1000E use Drive 16. 8169 and E1000B use Drive 32. So there are real life examples of real life working drivers that are in use and in production that use these kits. And you can always take one of those as a starting point and, and modify them to create whatever you want. A Bluetooth driver, for example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or whatever. Anybody wants to try MIDI, I'd be happy with that. Or, you know, whatever, yeah. So that's the conclusion. You're very welcome. No other questions?